Let's pray together. Lord, bless us tonight and give us your uh, understanding of the Word of God. We're just students here, Lord, and we need the great teacher to come. So you said in your Word, we need not that any man teach us, but the same anointing which we have received of him abideth in us. So uh, lead and guide us in all of our lessons, Lord. Help us to see Jesus at every turn. And I pray, Lord, that our understanding will sharpen and that we'll be able to take applicable truth home with us and that you will uh, help us to be rooted and grounded in the faith. We know the devil has all sorts of tricks he wants to play on us and uh, wants to toss us to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So we want to be firmly established in the truth and that you will abide with us here tonight, Lord, and be our leader and guide. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles to Job. We're in the 31st chapter and we're in the last words. So um, Job rests his case here in this uh, final dialogue. Really, it's more of a uh, diatribe. And he's already answered his critics who are now silenced. There's nothing more they're going to say because they realize there's, not, there's no way they're going to convince Job. He's uh, self-justified at this point. So uh, we have these expressions for what portion of God is there from above and what inheritance of the Almighty from on high. Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity, if my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. So he's leaving it in the uh, right uh, court of Almighty God. 
let God make the judge here because the three friends here have uh, they've made their judgment that Job is a hypocrite and uh, that he has hidden sin that nobody knows about but he's been found out because of the terrible things that have come upon him and so uh, they've made the judgment and they've uh, decided they've turned uh, the matter over and they, uh, now at this point Job defends himself and he says God has watched all my steps he knows everything or how I've lived my life in other words and we'll let him be the judge at the end uh, so his only plea is that he, uh, he gets an even or a fair judgment. That's what he's asking for here. An even scale in the judgments. Uh, that God may know his integrity. So, let's just look at this expression. Let me be weighed in an even balance. So we talk about the scales of judgment at this point. And uh, the Psalms speak about the the condign judgment of Almighty God. When we say condign, in other words, uh, whatever, it's always going to be according to righteousness and truth. And what he does will be fair and right, and there will be no argument and no appeal. Once, once the Lord gives his judgment, it will be the right judgment, and uh, everybody will be in agreement. And Psalm 98 speaks about the Lord and before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Equity. So this notion is uh, fairness, even scale. He doesn't have his hand uh, on one side of the scale tipping the, the scales uh, against you. He, he knows exactly what the truth is and he'll weigh it out in that fashion. Now right away as you're listening to all this, uh, we can be unnerved listening to this because we know a fair judgment would condemn everybody to hell. There's no doubt about it. Now remember again that we don't want to prejudge Job at this point. He suffered a lot. Uh, and now with these three that have, have just compounded his misery and have decided to uh, prosecute the, this case against him, uh, he feels as though, and we're all like this, we all, we're all like this, when, when, when we fear that the, the feel that people are just judging us incorrectly. We want to stand up. We want to defend ourselves. And that's what Job is doing here, kind of desperately. And, uh, and he's calling God to his aid at this point. He's, he's saying, uh, let God be my judge because he's watched everything and how I've lived my life. So uh, just give me an even judgment. Now what I ask for is, uh, I ask for mercy. You ask for mercy. Because we already know that the judgment would fall against us. And even judgment, a judgment of true equity would, would judge against us and convict us for eternity. So, so the scripture is very clear about this. And at the end, those that are lost, they're judged without mercy. Because they rejected mercy while they were here on earth. They lived their lives as though there was no God. Some of them tried to earn their way into heaven by penance and good works and trying to go to church and being a good boy or whatever it, they happened to think it was. But all the while, they did not rely upon the mercy of Christ to blot out their sin record. And so they'll be judged according to their works. And you'll find that in Revelation chapter 20 at the great white throne judgment. So we saw the dead small and great stand before God. The books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So that's how it's going to work for people that are lost. They'll be judged according to their works. And that's not going to be good. They think somehow, oh, I'll be okay then. You know, it's, uh, I, I'm a pretty good person. That, that's the notion. And Job is making that argument at this point. Now remember again that his understanding of redemption is primitive. Uh, we'll see, I think, uh, in this lesson, when we finally get to Elihu, Elihu was uh, of the family of Abraham. So we, uh, that, this is how we understand where do we place Job chronologically in time? Where, where is he placed? Even though you're finding him here in the middle of your Bibles, uh, don't be fooled by that. That's because the division of the Bible is, you know, the historical books, and then they've got then they've got the poetical books. So they've grouped them by a theme, not by chronology. Uh, there was a there was a book that was or a Bible that was written called the Chronological Bible by Ed Reese. This was back in the 70s, and he decided to put everything in his chronological order. So when you open uh, Ed Reese's uh, chronological Bible, the first book that you read is Job, because it's believed to be the earliest writing. Uh, so that's the way it works. So the the notion again of what did Job understand about redemption? Now there 
uh, flashes here and there throughout the book that indicates he did understand that. He understood it uh, to a degree, at least in a, in a kind of an adumbration or a shadow form. He didn't really understand it in the depths that you and I, now we've got a completed word of God and we understand truth manifested uh, through the scriptures. So it's really a completely different story for us. So, um, let's go back here to Psalm 99. Uh, again, the king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. So that's weighed in an even balance, isn't it? Uh, that's what the equity is all about. That God is an equitable God. Then uh, Genesis 18.25 when Abraham was arguing with God about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, he was certain that God would not do anything that was unrighteous. That God would give a, an equitable and a fair judgment, which he did. And what did he do? He destroyed the city and the sinners within that city. That was fair. That was right. But he argues at this point, because he's, uh, he's making petition, intercessory prayer for his loved ones that are there occupying a place and a birth and even a political position in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, you know, the argument that went back and forth there, uh, would you save it for 50, 45, 40, 20, 10, all the way down to 10. And uh, the argument back and forth about would he, he'd spare the city for 10 if he could find 10 righteous, which he never did. So he uses as the base of his argument the equitable nature of Almighty God. So Abraham said, you wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. That'd be far from you after that manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That'd be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What an expression that is and how certain that is. That uh, when we hear the accusations that are leveled against God by atheists, agnostics, complainers, skeptics, the disputers, uh, all of these people argue about the fairness of God and why does God let this happen and why is this, you know, and that, that that's their, that's their whole nature, and that, that becomes the justification for rejecting God uh, to their own damnation. But we all know that God will do what is right. And even though if we can't see or understand how it could be right, when he tells the children of Israel to go in and to literally annihilate an entire population, genocidal in that sense. And we look at that and say, how, how could that be right? We've got little innocent babies. They don't know any better and so forth. Why would God say you've got to take every one of them out? Uh, well, and that was, to me, it was a great uh, puzzle to some degree to have to figure out over the years. How could this be, how could this jibe with the nature of a loving, merciful God? And the, the answer is that how many years went on in those civilizations where God put up with what they did generation after generation after generation. There was nothing left to do, just like in the case of the antediluvians. He had to, he had to wipe them off, the, earth, the face of the earth. And when you begin to understand that the children that were involved there are children that God wants to spare. We find that in Jonah, right? They don't know their right hand from their left, and thus they're innocent. What has he done? He's actually spared them and saved them from how they would grow up under the influence of godless parents or idolatrous parents that would even be willing to sacrifice their own children to their fake God. So in a sense, we see the mercy of God in and, and wiping those civilizations out. But that takes a while to get to that kind of concept and understanding of the nature of God. And it begins with a premise or a, th a thesis, as you will. The, the theory is God is just, God is right, or is this question a rhetorical question? Shall not the God of the earth do right? And my answer is absolutely. So if it looks to me like I'm reading something in the Bible that doesn't seem right that God is doing, I must be wrong about how I'm perceiving what's happening here. I might not have enough information. I certainly don't live at the time. So don't understand understand the climate in which God does or permits what he does. Uh, so long ago I decided that I'm not here to debate how good God is. I already know that he's good. And I know that he's righteous. I know his judgments are equitable. So there's no doubt in my mind that if he says to do something, it must be for the good. And that it, it, is, uh, it, it is what God's nature is all about. Isaiah 11 tells us, uh, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. Now we're talking about in Isaiah 11, that would be Jesus, right? So he's the, uh, he's the root out of Jesse. So with the righteous uh, shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity uh, for the meek of the earth. 
And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, a lot of the judgments of God are, they're condigned in the sense of, uh, there, there's an ultimate judgment, isn't there? So we see a lot of people getting away with things, and there's injustice in a cursed world, and God evidently permits the injustice to go on. And we might argue again, well, why doesn't he come and stop this injustice? And uh, there's more to say about that at the end of our uh, discussion here tonight, that God, in fact, uh, requires us to endure injustice. Now, there's a lot of people need to understand that, and it's hard for people today to understand that, that, that nature, but there's things that happen, injustices that are never righted here on earth. And so we have to wait for the final day when all this is going to be taken care of. And so all this messy record here is going to be cleaned up. All right, so back to our text there. Start at the seventh verse now. So if my step had turned out of the way, and mine heart walked after mine eyes, and if, if any blot hath cleaved to mine hands, then let me sow and let another eat. In other words, uh, let there be a recompense for my evil. If I've done something evil, then, then let it be so. And if any blot uh, cleanse my hands, then let, let, me, let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out, if mine heart have been deceived by a woman, or if I've laid wait at my neighbor's door, he's talking about adultery, right, that he's done, then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her. For this is an heinous act, crime, yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges. So what's Job saying? Well, look, if I've done something wrong, I deserve whatever comes to me. And uh, so in this case, of course, he, he outlines again, and we, we did a whole study last week about adultery and fornication and all these sexual sins. And uh, Job says, if I've done any of these things, that's why he had made a covenant with his eyes. But he, he knew he was innocent in these matters. But he said, if, if that's the case, then, then let this be done to me. And, and again, even though he's justifying himself before the three friends, he's also making the argument to God. He's saying, well, what have I done to deserve what's happening to me? Uh, if, if your judgments are right and true, why is this occurring to me? You see, and this is the, something that plagued him. He, he needed an, an interview with the Almighty, uh, which is coming shortly. So what he's doing at this point is since, since God hasn't come to his defense, he's come to his own defense. And, uh, and he's put forth the argument. So in other words, he's saying, examine me. If there's something wrong, then I deserve whatever comes to me. But he couldn't think of what he could have done that would have brought this kind of judgment upon him. Now, self-examination is a part of the Christian walk. It's something we need to do all the time. And uh, we should be doing it on a daily basis. Is there something that I'm doing that's wrong, that's displeasing to God, and we want to get that out of our lives? Examine me, O Lord, uh, Psalm uh, 26, 2. Psalm 26 is all about, uh, you know, I shall not slide. It's quite an assertion there in the first verse. And, and so uh, you've got all these points that come thereafter, and I think there's 10 verses or so in Psalm 26. And each one of those is an outline of how to live your life so that, uh, so that we'll not backslide, will not, will not be in some kind of backsliding condition. I shall not slide. And so one of them here you can see is to examine yourself uh, and, 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 and invite God to examine your heart at all times. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. First Corinthians says in a New Testament sense, uh, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread. He's talking about the, the communion table and drink of that cup. Self-examination. And uh, the word itself even appears here in uh, 2 Corinthians 13.5. So examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know, uh, know not your, your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. So that's all about looking within and examining and, and uh, ferreting out anything there that is impure and that God, it would be displeasing to God. Um, Job 23.10 earlier, but he knoweth the way that I take. And we just, that's kind of a repetition of what he just said. He knows my steps. He knows everything that I'm doing. And being aware of this at all times, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the earth. Proverbs 15.3, the eyes of the Lord uh, behold the evil and the good. 
He's got uh, omniscience. There's nothing you can do to hide from God. I mean, that's so obvious to all of us. But because we can't see him watching us, and what a difference that makes. I was just commenting to my wife, you know, we have a guy that walks his rather large dog uh, every night, and he comes by people's yards, and he lets the dog do his uh, business in other people's yards. Now, I think he picks it up. Can you imagine? Oh, that's right. We've got dog lovers here. But, I mean, going around and picking stuff like that up, it's disgusting. But, uh, but it, you know, so they, he does this. And, and I'm thinking to myself, but, you know, if you walk outside, they pull the dog away. You know, like, what are you doing here? But we know what you, if I wasn't looking, he'd be leaving his mess on my property, right? That's, you, there's no sympathy here. Everybody seems to say that's okay. Let him do that, right? We should just take all of that that they leave in your yard and take it over to their yard. But at any rate, uh, where was I going with? Well, at any rate, I wanted to, that was on my heart to bring that out. But I thought it has nothing to do with it. If somebody's watching you, you wouldn't do it, would you? You know, so, so as soon as you step outside, the dog owner pulls the dog back. Like, what are you doing here going to the bathroom? And somebody, well, what, what do you think you're doing? You're walking him to do that. That's, uh, so, if, so if nobody's watching... Well, if we could understand that God is seeing everything that we do, uh, that is, there's no place that you can go where he, his vision doesn't uh, penetrate, the, then that would make a big difference, I think. So he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? And then uh, David writes... Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me, and shall find nothing. That, that's something to say there, isn't it? I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. And here he's even talking, I mean the mouth, James says, that's the little member of the body that boasts great things. It's a world of iniquity. It's on fire from hell, isn't it? So the man that's pure in his speech is, is pure altogether. Uh, so, but the psalmist here says, I, I'm purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. And Jeremiah tells us, but thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me, thou hast tried mine heart toward thee. All right, so back to our text there when Job says, If I did this, that, and the other, then this would be an appropriate response. And what I'm going through uh, would be uh, something that I truly deserve. And so that's how he's looking at this circumstance, uh, which I find interesting now. So several times he uses the conditional if. If. There's a book that was written by Amy Carmichael called If. Everybody familiar? Anybody familiar with it? Okay, so it's just a little uh, devotional. I don't even, is it 40 pages, 30 pages, something like that. So in it, she proposes, uh, and of course, it's if, uh, if I have not compassion on my fellow servant, even as my Lord hath pity on me, then I know nothing of Calvary love. So it's if I do this, then I don't, you know, if and then. So if, uh, if I can easily discuss the shortcomings and the sins of any, if I can speak in a casual way even of a child's misdoings, then I know nothing of Calvary's love. If I can write an unkind letter, speak an unkind word, think an unkind thought without grief and shame, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If I can hurt another by speaking uh, faithfully without much preparation of spirit and without um, hurting myself far more than I hurt the other, then I know nothing of Calvary's love. I'll just give you some samples. So if I took offense easily, if I am content to continue in a cool unfriendliness, though friendship be possible, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If a sudden a jar can cause me to speak an impatient, unloving word, then I know nothing of Calvary's love. For a cup of brimful of sweet water cannot spill even one drop of bitter water, however suddenly jolted. If I feel bitterly towards those who condemn me as it seems to me, unjustly forgetting that if they know me as I know myself, they would condemn me much more. Then I know nothing of Calvary 
love. So, of course, there are many pages that continue on. It's all about uh, the love, the agape love that Christ has had for us. And we have to think those matters through. I mean, very convicting words, obviously. Amy Carmichael uh, you know, lived during that time of great revival, turn of the century type, uh, 18th, 19th, 20th century, where you had the, what were called Christian mystics. And they were individuals that were uh, wholly given over to devotion to the Lord. And uh, um, you have people that, that wrote things like this that are extremely convicting. And by reading them, I think uh, that's condemnatory. And so it becomes a challenge for uh, us to read it. And then when we look at the sacrifice that many of them made and how they lived their lives, and many of them gave themselves up to missionary efforts and sometimes died as a result. Uh, they really lived it. They didn't talk about it. They lived it. You read the life of C.T. Studd or Adoniram Judson or uh, David Livingston, uh, William Booth, George Mueller. You've got all these people that lived during that time. It was an amazing time. All right. Uh, so I just thought I'd take the concept of that and say, look, if you look in our text here, you're going to find 18 ifs, where Job is putting out the same kind of an argument. If I did this, then this is what ought to happen to me. And so it's a little different than Amy Carmichael's, but uh, we can go through it here list by list. So if, if I've walked with vanity, he said, if my foot hasted to deceit, well, then... Let me be weighed in an even balance, that God may know my integrity. Uh, so, so what's Job? He's, he's saying, bring it on. He's inviting, he, he's examining himself. He said, from what I can tell, I have not walked in vanity. I haven't hasted to deceit. And you know, all that's true in a sense, in, in, in a relative sense. Remember that in the outset of the chapters here, uh, it was God that said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? He's an upright man that uh, feareth God and escheweth evil. So th there was a sense in which God had commended the life of Job. Not that that could justify him and save his soul, but, but that as a, as a sincere believer in God, he walked in the fear of God. And he tried to please God with his life, which is what we're supposed to do as Christians. So uh, then he goes on with his argument, If my step hath turned out of the way, and mine heart walked after mine eyes, uh, back to what he was talking about, I had a covenant with his eyes, uh, and so uh, pornography and all this. Uh, you say, well, that's only uh, that's our problem today. Well, they had problems. In, they called them pleasant pictures in the book of Isaiah, if you go to the original language on that. So they, they had uh, their own pornography, so to speak, at that time, and also lusting after uh, various women. Harlots had their uh, various ways of attracting and seducing. You read this in Proverbs 7. So, um, so clearly, the, the lust factor w was just as present then as it is today. And, and, but Job is saying, if that happened, he said, then if, if my steps have turned out of the way, if I've gone away from God in some fashion, if I've even let my eyes stray away from God, if any uh, blood hath cleaved to mine hands, anything that, that would make me unclean, then then let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. Uh, so now he's even pronouncing a generational curse. He's saying, if this has happened and, and I did this, I don't deserve uh, for my posterity to live a, a, a clean and holy life. It's a lot to say here. Uh, so he had to have a certain degree of self-assurance here that he had pleased God with the life that he lived. When we get to Elihu's argument, we'll understand how this is finally straightened out, by the way. If, he says, mine heart hath been deceived by a woman. Now he's talking about uh, adultery. He's talking about cheating on his wife. If I have laid wait at my neighbor's door. Uh, so he coveted his neighbor's wife, laid wait at the neighbor's door. Then uh, let my wife grind unto another. There's some, uh, I guess, contest about the meaning here grinding. Uh, well, literalists claim that that means let, let her become a slave at the grinding mill. Um, but I think it's more metaphorical. I think it's talking here literally about uh, let her then be uh, taken in the act of adultery herself. Uh, grinding is, becomes then a metonymy for the sexual act. So let my wife grind unto another and let others bow down upon her uh, for this is an heinous crime. 
all the way back now into antiquity, you can see that, that God had no use for that, and brings judgment, as he says in Hebrews 13, uh, adulterers and whoremongers God will judge. That's a very uh, emphatic statement right there, and uh, all believers need to remember this, because uh, you don't ever want to fall into that act. It's, it's a terrible act. Uh, it's heinous. So we're extremely egregious, heinous act. And uh, it's done against your own body. It's, of course, it's done against your family as well. If I did despise the cause of my manservant or my maidservant, we've addressed the matter of slavery. Uh, and it seems uh, as though uh, that Paul, for instance, speaks about uh, the uh, uh, servants obeying your masters. And people point to this and say, what, does the Bible condone slavery? Well, slavery is what existed during that time, and it wasn't quite what it was uh, during the wicked times that they actually sold people into slavery. Slavery actually, uh, or servitude, was the same as what I might call, or you might call, a job. Uh, here you were uh, in need of work, and you would go to a, a man that owned a, some kind of a field, and, and you would hope for work. And, and if he was a good master, he would say, you can live here. You, your family can live here. And uh, in return, you work the fields. And there were good masters, in other words. And it was a good relationship, servant and master, but not always. And Job here indicates, well, if I was a cruel servant, let's not forget that he had lands, he had cattle, he had things that would require workmen. And uh, so he would hire them in the sense of, you would stay here, I'll quarter you, I'll feed you, I'll supply your needs, I'll protect you and your family, and you work in return in my fields. So here he says, if I've despised their cause, in other words, if, if and there are, there are certainly evil slave uh, drivers, and, they, they, and probably the greater percentage of them were evil and way, uh, wayward people that did uh, what they did and abused people. But that's what Job argued, if, if that's how I was towards them, uh, if I have withheld from the poor from their desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel myself alone, and the fatherless had nothing to eat, if I've done these things, he says, if I've, uh, if I've seen any perish for want of clothing or any poor without covering, if his loins have uh, not blessed me, if uh, he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, he goes right down the list here. If I've lifted up my hand against the fatherless when I saw my help in the gate, then, then let mine arm fall from my shoulder blade. Now this is, you could say it's hyperbolic language, and exaggerative language. Let my arm fall out of my shoulder blade. But uh, the reason he's using it, because hyperbole is an emphatic way of stating how much you would detest the thing that he had just said. All these things, he said, if this is who I was and this is how I lived my life, if I ignored the need of others, if I intentionally uh, uh, fed myself and didn't care about the needs of those that were around me, then if that were the case, then it would be better that my arm would fall out of my socket. Now, this is typical Hebrew idiom. And this is, uh, in a sense, a little before the concept of uh, Hebraic uh, language. But none nonetheless, even in the New Testament, Jesus employs a very similar thing when he says, if, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. In other words, it'd be better to have my eye plucked out. It'd be better to have my hand cut off, my foot cut off. These, these are all hyperbolic statements in, intended to give emphasis to how horrible it would be to do this act. It would be better that such a thing would happen to us. Better that my shoulder would fall out. My arm would fall out of my shoulder. My arm be broken from the bone. For destruction from God was a terror to me. If uh, I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. If I uh, rejoice because of my wealth was great, and because my hand hath uh, gotten much. Well, that's the notion again of people, and it's in the New Testament concept. Jesus warned about trusting uh, the uh, mammon. Mammon, of course, is a, a term, uh, it's uh, the god of money, the god of wealth. And you put your faith in that. And if that's where your faith is, then it can't be in God. And so uh, 
Job said if, if with all the wealth that he had, he wasn't trusting uncertain riches. First uh, Timothy chapter 6, God, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing up. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that be rich fall into temptations and snares and to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in perdition and sorrow. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Uh, and then later on, of course, the notion there of uh, not to trust in uncertain riches. Because uh, Proverbs say what riches grow wings and fly away. So Job is saying a similar thing here. And this is, this is early uh, in the concept of axiomatic wisdom. It, he said, uh, if I've trusted gold, if that's where my hope is, then woe be to me. Well, someone decided long ago to put on the, on the dollar bill, in God we trust. Uh, almost a, a reminder to say, can't be you, you can't be trusting in that dollar bill. It must be in God alone. Of course, the atheists want that off. They want that off the uh, currency. And they'll probably get their way at some point with all of this, right? Because we're in the woke generation after all. We can't have this on our dollar. If I rejoice because my wealth was great, because mine hand hath gotten much. If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart hath been secretly enticed, or my mouth hath kissed my hand. Now he's talking about, you know, believing in yourself, self-reliance, and that all this has come by you, by yourself. You've decided, uh, just like Nebuchadnezzar, all this kingdom have I uh, made by my own might and power. Or like the rich fool that said, uh, uh, now I've got to, off to tear down my bar barns and build bigger ones. All of this is from my own labor and my own craftiness and my uh, business acumen. I've accumulated all this. And all of this is for me. Now I'll take my ease, drink, and be merry, and so on. Uh, I'll kiss my hand in that sense. Then this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge. For I should have denied the God that is above. If I rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him. Boy, this is a hard one, because after all, when somebody does you wrong, you will rejoice and say, oh, they got theirs. When the news comes to us of the calamity that they've fallen in, <laughs> you know, we, we kinda, we're kind of glad. <laughs> Not me, I'm talking about you guys. Uh, but boy, I can remember a situation very, <laughs> very much like that, an enemy that I had and so on. And uh, I wanted to take matters in my own hand, but the Lord, uh, thankfully, he does some, such a better job. Really, he does such a better job. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So you don't have to worry about it. And, and uh, God will catch up with these. And uh, the, when I got the news, it was, uh, I was kind of happy to hear the news and then I said well you know that's not the attitude to have you can't have that attitude um, there was another occasion a guy he spoke against me publicly and um, likened me to Mao Tung, which is you know thankfully most people didn't know who, who he was but um, and that was you know that was it and he was he would come to church and he'd, take, he'd be taking notes in the back of the church and when I said something that uh, uh, he felt was applicable to me, he would shout amen. He never said amen in the whatever five years he was here at church, but all of a sudden he was saying amen. And anything that he thought I was accusing myself with, and he, would write, he had notes about all this contradiction and so forth. Um, and he left. God does answer prayer. but um, And then he stroked, and he couldn't speak. And uh, so the word got back to me. I said, well, you know, what am I supposed to do? And so forth. Well, we thought you would want to know and maybe go visit him. Well, the first thought was, what? Visit? He's my enemy. Why would I visit him? And then God convicted me and said, you know, he's your enemy. And uh, what are you supposed to do? Well, I, I've got to go get, get some coals of fire and put it on his head. I said, what am I going to do? I, I've got to do some service then. So I went to see him in the hospital. And it was a pathetic scene. And he saw me and he couldn't speak. And I think he was surprised to see me there. And uh, so I took his hand and I prayed with him. Amen. Now, I'm glad I did that. I didn't want to do that, but that, that was the right thing to do. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what Jesus would do. 
Now, I'd like to say I did with a perfect heart, but I didn't, obviously. Uh, I was uh, compelled more than, more than willing. But we do what we're supposed to do. And this is what Job's bringing up. And he said, hey, you want to keep all of this in mind because everybody has an enemy, right? Uh, I've had several. So if I rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me, uh, or lifted up myself when evil found him, but, he said, neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. Remember David, uh, when he was, uh, he was cast out, and um, I'm trying to remember his name, was uh, casting a curse at him as he was leaving Jerusalem and so forth. And uh, he was now an exiled king. And uh, so as he's going out, they, uh, his bodyguard said, Let, let's go take his head off. You know, we'll kill him for what he's saying about you. David said, no, I deserve this. So we'll, we'll let him say what he has to say. And when he came back in triumph after Absalom's death, then here was that same enemy. Why can't I remember his name? And he came. Shimei. Yeah, it's Shemiah, right. <laughs> So he comes and he bows down and, and begs for mercy. And David could have said, hey, take his head off. But he didn't. He showed him mercy. And um, he didn't suffer his mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. So remember all of this. Keep it in mind. Tuck it away for later use. Uh, because certainly if you live long enough and live the Christian life long enough, the opportunity will, will come. And you'll decide not to take the vengeance. And, uh, and God will be pleased with your decision. So, if men of the tabernacle said not, Oh, that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. But the stranger did not like... Of course, this has to do with... You have people that were working for you in your, in your house, the tabernacle, right? And, uh, and they were longing for the flesh on your table that you had, you had meat and, and they had nothing. And uh, they, were, they were longing for that pining for, uh, because they're hungry. Uh, and, and the stranger, he said, but the stranger in my house or that lodged in my street, what, I opened my doors to the traveler. I gave them what they needed and I provided hospitality to those that were in need. If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom. You know why this is so important, by the way? Um, it's just validation that Job considered Adam an actual person. Modernists today are trying to tell us, well, there really wasn't uh, an Adam. Uh, they uh, had fallen into the school of uh, origin, believing that Everything uh, uh, in the Old Testament stories are just that. They're stories. They're Aesop's fables. They're stories that were concocted just to teach principles that were not to take it literally. So there's no literal Adam. There's some skeptic, some mock, uh, I guess he's a theologian, uh, but he has his ad on. Uh, and his ad, uh, he's got his little ponytail in the back and his... Uh, glasses, and he's sitting in a classroom, so he must be some kind of theological professor. And he's saying, hey, how, can, how can a serpent talk? You know, he starts that stuff, you know. And you can hear people laughing kind of in the background. You know, how, how can a serpent talk? And everybody gets, you get a kick out of this. In other words, it's just a story, that's all. Uh, I wouldn't want to stand before God and mock what is literal, what the Bible speaks of as literal. In this case, Job says, Adam was a person. Jesus spoke of Adam. This is all a book that self-validates itself. So when you read it in one place, it's confirmed in another and then another and another. And that tells us this isn't something that was just made up. This is not fable. This, these were actual people. And that Adam sinned and hid himself, as it tells us in Genesis 3, is validated right here by Job's words. So he said, if I covered my transgression like Adam, who covered his by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Well, he didn't do that, but my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that my adversary had written a book. He said, if that's the case, if, I, if I've hidden my sin somewhere, then I ask God to open the book and show me what those sins are. And I'm telling my adversary, the three that came to criticize and accuse Job, write a book. Write it all down. What did Jesus say when he appeared before the judge and uh, they wanted uh, to bring accusations against him and they wanted Jesus to incriminate himself? 
Uh, and when they asked him about certain teachings, Jesus said, ask those that heard me. Ask them. Bring them up here. Let them witness against me. They heard me. He said, no, I didn't teach in a secret place. It was all in public. And so let the witnesses come up and let them uh, accuse me of what I said. And that's all that Job is saying as well. I didn't cover anything. I'm not hiding some kind of secret sin that nobody knows about. It's all open for discussion. Anybody that has a charge, let them bring the charge. If I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, then let thistles grow instead of wheat, and cockle instead of barley. Now he's talking about uh, cheating in business affairs. And this goes on all the time where people uh, get over on somebody. They, you know, they did they intentionally uh, lied about a circumstance, sold a piece of ground that was really uh, couldn't grow any uh, crops on, and uh, didn't tell the people that, didn't give that information. You know, if you sell a house today, you have to have a list of things that you know that are wrong with your house and you have to be able to give them a list and say look I know that this is wrong because that can come back later and they'll say well you didn't put this down on the list and here you didn't tell us that this uh, property is riddled with mines and that you've had mines as subsidence you have to tell people these things uh, but that law was, was is a recent law because we've had people cheat and lie and uh, that's what he's talking about here if I've eaten the fruits thereof without money or I caused the owners thereof to lose their life, and their life uh, in this case means their livelihood because I've cheated them in some fashion or I, I, I didn't tell them uh, and disclose all of the information. Then, in that case, then let thistles or thorns grow instead of my wheat uh, and cockle instead of barley. Let, let, let it come back to me as a result. So there you have those 18 ifs and thens uh, that you can put together here. So he's made quite a convincing argument if you've ever been in a courtroom, you, you'll watch the arguments that go on there. And the final argument is what this is. Uh, this is the last statement that you can make before the jury or the judge makes his recommendation. So I say at this point, Job rests his case. So, uh, and this is where we get to the final verse of our text there in this chapter, is that the words of Job are ended. Now, what he means by that, Job will have something more to say here a little later on. He's talking about his argument. Uh, he rests his case. This is everything. He just went through a whole litany of things. He said, if any of these things I'm guilty of, then, then, then let the recompense come. Let the judgment come upon me. I deserve this. So the conclusion of Job's long speech, and you can see it started in chapter 26 and goes all the way here down to the end of 31 is now reached. He winds it up by a solemn vindication of himself from all the charges of wicked conduct which have been alleged or insinuated against him by the three. Perhaps it may be said that he goes further, maintaining generally his moral rectitude and respect of all principal duties which a man owes either to God, and you'll see all this written throughout that discourse, or to his fellows. He protects a protest that he is innocent of impure thoughts, of false seeming, of adultery, of in, injustice toward his dependents, of hardness towards the poor and needy, of covetousness, of idolatry, of malevolence, of want of hospitality, of hiding his transgressions, of injustice as a landlord. In conclusion, he wants uh, more, makes a solemn appeal to God to pronounce judgment on his case, promising to give complete account of every act of his life and calmly to await his sentence. So, um, so this is the uh, this is the conclusion. So, uh, the words of Job here, in the sense, are ended. There's nothing more he needs to add to what he's already said. He's made uh, he's made, I think, a very strong case. And it's what he's been pondering for all this time. So why am I going through all of this? He still doesn't have an answer to that. Because as far as he's concerned, he really doesn't deserve this. And since you and I are privy to what was going on in chapter 1 and 2, we understand what was going on with Job uh, in the heavens. The discourse between God and Satan. And why God said, all right, I'm going to let him be tempted and tested to prove that he truly does love me, that I'm not paying him 
and richly blessing him so he will bless me in return will take everything away and will put him to the ultimate test. Now Job didn't know that that's what was going on. And as a result, he's looking to himself, he's, what did I do to deserve this? That's how we kind of began our lectures here. What did I do? So that's, uh, so he rests his case. Now there was an interesting uh, proposition that was, I think, somewhere in the 50s it came up, the, the notion of if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Uh, you probably all heard that, haven't you? I mean, it's, uh, it's something to ponder. Okay, so if you were arrested, they said the charge is you are a born-again Christian, and you're under arrest. Now, if they brought you before a judge and a jury, would there be enough evidence that could condemn you? That they'd say, absolutely, we found you are guilty of being a Christian. So what kind of evidence would you be able to produce at a moment like that? Well, you can say, well, I confess Christ as my Lord and my Savior. That's a good thing. But confessions, well, as a matter of fact, in the legal sense, it's, uh, they, they, they use an expression in the courts, corpus delecti. And corpus delecti is uh, basically, it's saying you can't just take a person's confession. Believe it or not, people have confessed to things they didn't do. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But, but there are many cases like this where people actually make a confession to something they never actually did. There it is, corpus delecti. Provides that a, a confession standing alone isn't enough for a conviction. With its design of preventing wrongful convictions, the rule implicitly acknowledges the phenomenon of false confessions. So someone can come in and say, I'm turning myself in. Uh, I robbed a bank, uh, armed robbery, and, uh, and I did these things, I'm turning myself in. Now you say, well, that's enough right there. He confessed to it. He confessed to it, but is there any evidence that he even did this thing? So now, now, before they can actually send him away, they've got to go find out if a bank has been robbed. And uh, was it an armed robbery? And when was it uh, accomplished? And they look at the confession and see if any of these things match. And if they don't, then they can't put this guy in jail. They can't convict him. It could be a false confession. Now, what's the point? Well, the point is, there are a lot of people who make a false confession. They'll tell you all day long that they're born again, that they're saved. Now, again, that's not for me to judge or to you to judge. If they've made the profession, we can't really go beyond that. But what we are allowed to judge is the fruit of their life. And we can look at the fruit and say, yeah, something doesn't add up here. He says he's a Christian, but here he is. He's stealing from work or he's, uh, you know, cursing, uses a lot of curse words. These things aren't commensurate with the Christian life. And you begin to say, you know, something's puzzling about this. So he's made the confession, but could we really convict him as, as being a true Christian? Well, again, we don't have to decide that, but I can tell you one thing, the great white throne will decide that. There'll be nobody that stands there that gets in accidentally. They don't get in without a wedding garment. They don't get in without being clothed in Christ. So something, something must be wrong here. So phony Christianity or hypocritical Christianity, and that's what uh, they were arguing, the three were arguing about Job, is that he was really a hypocrite and secret, uh, in secret he was doing things that deserve what he got. This passage in the New Testament in Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, in works they deny him. So now the works aren't saving anybody, but that is the evidence the evidence that they truly are born again is that you look at their life and their life reflects the nature of Christ. Now remember, some bring forth tenfold, some uh, sixtyfold, some a hundredfold. And so we can't measure by how much a person is doing for the Lord. We only measure what we can see. So in works they deny him being abominable and what disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. So notice again here that Paul is dealing with this in the first century and we're dealing with in the 21st century. And so we can't just accept somebody's confession because they might really, it might be corpus delecti. They might just be confessing to something that they really are not guilty of. Now is there enough evidence in your life that if we put you up on a, uh, a courtroom trial that you could be convicted? 
that we could bring evidence up and say, oh, yes, they're, they're Christians. They, come, they go to church every week. Well, that not, might not be enough either, right? You can sit here and not be in agreement with anything. Uh, you could say, well, you know, he uh, puts money in the offering plate. There are a lot of people who do that without really being saved. So little by little, look what Job did. He goes through a litany of things that he had accomplished and done to prove that he, true, he was a true believer. Now, that wasn't really even part of the contest that was going on here. There was no doubt that Job was a true believer. What Satan was trying to say was, he's only a believer because you're letting all these good things happen. Take all that away and we'll see if he is a, a, a true believer. And the answer to that is obvious. He was a true believer. Confused and perplexed by why all of this was happening, thinking somehow that he had done something to deserve this judgment. James is the book about good works, isn't it? And so, uh, even so faith without works, uh, that hath not works is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith by thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So this creates all kinds of problems. Uh, you know, this is where we get these various theological constructs. Uh, the, the, the notion somehow of a works-related salvation. This is what Pelagius taught. And the notion that you could earn your way in and by doing good works. And they, they almost inevitably go back to this passage and say, well, it's faith without works. If you don't have works, you're not, not, that's not what this is saying. It says, I'll show you my faith. The faith is already existent. How, do I, how can you know that I have true faith? The only way you can know it is by seeing it manifested in my life, by how I live my life. And you can make then at least an external judgment to say, well, look what they do for the Lord. Look how they live their lives. That is, that's the testament. And that's all that Job is really doing here at this point. He's not trying to justify that he's going to heaven because he's done all these good things. He's demonstrating his faith must be true because what else would motivate a man to do it? We all automatically know that we're born selfish. And that we come out of the womb demanding. And that our, our whole life is about serving ourselves until we come to Christ. And then, then our lives are broken and then, then we recognize uh, that we're nothing without Him. So we've arrived here at the end of the lesson here tonight. Uh, uh, and the end of the words of Job in that sense. Uh, much more to add next week. So let's pray. So Lord, give us your blessings here and what we have to learn. And, and we're grateful for all that Job teaches us, Lord. And there's so much uh, that will be practical information in the hour of our need. Uh, when perhaps we're sorely tempted in one fashion or another. And the devil will be right there to suggest that uh, we ought to give up on God. But Lord, uh, we cannot deny him. Even if we abide unfaithful in one way or another, he cannot deny himself. So, Lord, as long as we have been truly born of your Spirit, and we have the evidence of that in our own heart, the self-assurance is not good enough, but the Spirit assurance, the Spirit himself uh, convinces us, bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. So we don't need anybody else's confirmation but yours, Lord. So confirm it in our hearts tonight, Lord. We pray that all of us here can, like Job, be able to justify and say, well, my, my works would indicate the way I conduct myself uh, before others and in my home, at my work or school, uh, would indicate that I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm his property. Thankfully, Lord, our understanding of truth is so much deeper than what Job could have ever had. We have now a completed New Testament, the finished work of Christ on the cross, and the great advantage of your Holy Spirit living inside of us. So bring us your blessings here tonight, Lord, and may we have assurance from above, an assurance and a certitude that cannot be shaken. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come into my heart, Lord.